Matthew chapter 6. We made it through one whole book of Matthew in a couple of weeks. Matthew chapter 6, verse number 1 is, is kind of where we'll be starting. So, so far we've learned a lot of different principles that Christ taught. And today we're going to learn three more principles that the Jews practiced, just like uh, they were practicing the law. This is a principle that the Jews practiced, but they weren't necessarily practicing it properly. So the three things that we're going to look at today is alms, prayer, and fasting. Alms, prayer, and fasting. One thing that I noticed, as, and we'll notice as we go through it together, is Christ expects us to do these three things. When Christ says, and when you do your alms, or when you pray, or when you fast, he doesn't say, well, if you fast, or if you pray, or if you do alms, do it this way. Christ expects us to do these things as a Christian. As a Christian, we should want to do these things. So the first one that Christ mentions is alms. I'm going to open up as well with you. Matthew chapter 6, verse number 1. Take heed that ye do not your alms before men to be seen of them. Otherwise ye have no reward of your Father which is in heaven. Therefore when thou doest thine alms, do not sound a trumpet before thee, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets that um, they have their that they may have glory of men verily I say unto you they have their reward verse number three but when thou doest alms let not thy left hand know what thy right hand doeth verse number four that thine alms may be in secret and thy father which seeth in secret himself shall reward thee openly I'm going to pray and then we're going to dive into this lesson alms, prayer, and fasting. Lord, we're so thankful for another opportunity to learn from your word, to read your word. Lord, I ask that you would open our hearts and our minds. Lord, thank you for the lessons that you've taught me uh, as we've been going through this uh, study of the Sermon on the Mount. Lord, I ask that you would give me the right words to say to be able to portray your message properly. I'll be with the next service as well. Give Pastor the words to speak to us. In Jesus' name, amen. So the word alms would be money, resources, or of that such, marked specifically to help the poor, the needy, or the destitute. So it would be maybe food. Somebody needs food. They're going through a tough time. Uh, water, money, financially. Um, if they need a ride, going place to place. A uh, place to stay maybe if they're in a real, real tough spot. So this is what alms would be. But we see that there is a wrong way to give alms. Verse number one and verse number two, take heed that ye do not your alms before men to be seen of them. Otherwise, ye have no reward of your Father which is in heaven. Therefore, when thou doest thine alms, do not sound a trumpet before thee as the hypocrites do in the synagogues. First thing I see is when we give alms, we're not doing it to draw attention to ourselves. I know that seems kind of basic for us, but... The scribes, the Pharisees, when they would do alms, they would make sure that everybody around them saw that they were doing a good deed of service. The poor beggar on the street, when they would give it, they, you know, Christ says, don't sound a trumpet. I don't know if they actually had a trumpet with them to sound it, but I'm sure they were pretty boastful when they were giving their alms, or else Christ wouldn't have men mentioned this. So we don't want to give to draw attention to ourselves, but Verse number three, I see that we don't give out of convenience. I'll read that verse. It says, But when thou doest alms, let not thy left hand know what thy right hand doeth. I've heard two different, basically, definitions for this verse. First definition would be, don't let your left hand know what your right hand doing, meaning that we should be giving so discreetly or so privately that basically if our right hand or our left hand had a mind of their own, that not even the left hand would be aware that we're giving. So basically we're giving so privately, so discreetly, that nobody knows, not even our own body would know that we're giving. That is one example I heard. Another example I heard would be if you see, so like Brother Joe is in need of something. So I reach into my pocket and I have lots of money. So when I reach into my pocket, I would have a fistful of either coins or money. So when we reach into our pocket, sometimes we'll do this. Here you go. There you go. Don't let your right hand 
or don't let your left hand know what your right hand's doing. So instead of me doing that, when I would reach into my pocket and pull out whatever amount of money that I had, I don't use this hand to search through it. I would just reach into my pocket and I would get those bit of money. <laughs> I borrowed it from my wife, so I can't give it to you. So in either way, don't give out of convenience. Um, uh, portion of scripture I'd like to bring note to would be Acts chapter 5 and I'll have you turn forward to Acts chapter 5 and we'll kind of read this passage of scripture together. Acts chapter number 5. Give a little bit of uh, backstory to this here. So we have the early churches being started. Chapter 4, you can read the end of chapter 4 if you'd like to get a little more context. We have the early churches being started and we have members giving sacrificially. So they have lands or properties or things that they don't necessarily need. They're selling the, their properties and they're giving to the church super sacrificially for the Lord's work to support the Lord's work. And this is where we find um, the story of Ananias and Sapphira. I'll start reading Acts chapter 5, verse number 1. But a certain man named Ananias, with Sapphira his wife, sold a possession and kept back part of the price, his wife also being privy to it, and, bought, uh, and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. So we have people selling their things, giving to the church. Is that good? Yes, that's good. They sold whatever it was, their possession, and they kept back a part of the price. Now, it's their possession. It's their prerogative to give however much that they were, you know, wanted to give. The issue here is that they sold X amount of property and they gave just like everybody else gave, assuming that, oh, they came and they gave all that they had, but they didn't. They were doing this more of a show like, oh, look, we're also selling everything that we have and we're also giving it all. But they weren't. Verse number three, and but Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost and to keep back part of the price of the land? While it remains, was it not thine own? And after it sold, was it not thine own in thine own power? So what Peter's saying, when it was yours, it was yours, right? And when you sold it, that's still yours. But what Ananias and Sapphira did is they lied when they gave their alms and when they gave their offering, they weren't giving it out of, they were, they were giving it out of convenience. They weren't giving it wholly to the Lord. And that was a problem. Verse number five, and Ananias hearing these words fell down and gave up the ghost um, and great fear came on all them that heard these things. So after Ananias came in to give his full offering to the Lord, Peter calls him out, Ananias falls down flat, and all the other church members are afraid. And then <laughs> Sapphira, Sapphira, his wife, comes in, says, tells the same story that Ananias gives. She also falls down flat. And I'm sure for the next few months, years, people did not lie about the amount of offering that they gave to the Lord. The, ch the church was afraid. Because it's a serious thing when you give, and when you give alms, you're giving alms and you're giving your offering to the Lord for the Lord. It's not for your own praise. It's not for out of your own convenience. So that's one thing that I notice in Matthew chapter 6. When you give your alms, don't give to draw attention and don't give out of convenience. I'm going to go back to Matthew chapter number 6. Next we see that there is a right way to give alms. There's a wrong way, but then there's a right way to give alms. Number one, give privately. And we kind of already mentioned that. Verse number four. That thy alms may be in secret, and thy Father, which seeth in secret himself, shall reward thee openly. God sees everything. God sees the good. God sees the bad. That poor person on the street, when you walk by, they got the homeless sign. When you give them money, there's no, if there's nobody else standing around, and you give that money to them, and you think nobody else sees, God sees. And your Father, which seeth in secret, shall reward thee openly. Luke chapter number 21. I'm going to turn forward there and I'm going to read this portion. Luke chapter number 21, verse number 1. And he looked up and he saw 
a rich, uh, the rich man casting their gifts into the treasury. This is Christ seeing this. And he saw also a certain poor widow casting in thither two mites. And he said, of a truth I say unto you, that this poor widow hath cast in more than they all. For they all have out of their abundance cast into the offering of God. But she um, of her penury has cast in all the living that she had. So here we have the widow with two mites. I looked up the value of two mites. It would be equivalent to one sixty-fourth of a day's wage. We talked about a talent. A talent being one full day's wage. A mite would be one sixty-fourth of a day's wage. So pennies on the dollar. She was probably embarrassed about the amount that she gave. The other people, the rich people, it says here that they were giving out of their abundance. You know, they made good, good money. Their offering was not a drop in the hat to what they had. Now this lady, she gave everything that she had. Was it much? No. Was she embarrassed? She probably was embarrassed. Nobody's saying, oh, look, I'm giving a dollar this week because I'm broke. I don't, have, I don't have a job. And this is all that I have in my wallet is a dollar. When you give a dollar, you're probably embarrassed. But here Christ says this, this woman gave more than all the rich people combined because she gave all of her living. When we give, we give privately, we give without expectations as well. The Pharisees and, and the Sadducees, when they gave, they were expecting something in return. What were they expecting? They were expecting maybe uh, praise. They were expecting maybe a better position. Like, oh, Brother Larry, he, he gives $1,000 a week to the church. Maybe we should ask him to be on the deacon board, or maybe he could be on staff or head of our finances. This, that's what the Pharisees were looking for. They were looking for a position. They were looking for praise. When you give your alms, like this widow lady, when she gave her alms, she gave it to the Lord. She gave all that she had. She didn't give out of convenience. And that's what Christ expects from us. He expects him to bless us. It says, thy father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. When you give, don't expect anything in return. Let God take care of that. Don't expect praise or position. Next, we see prayer. Verse number 5 through 15. I'm going to read verse number 5. It says, And when thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are, for they love to pray, standing in the synagogues and in the corner of the streets, that they may be seen of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. Prayer, what is prayer? Prayer is direct communication to God and not for anyone else, right? When we pray, we don't pray to a person. We don't pray to a thing. We pray to God. There's a wrong way to pray. Do not pray focused on people listening. Here we see Christ says the, the Pharisees, they love, or the hypocrites, they love to pray, standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets. I'm sure we've heard it. I know I've heard it before, not, not necessarily here, but I've heard somebody pray before, and it's really lavish words that I don't necessarily understand. They're probably much more mature than I am. And you can tell when somebody is praying to God, or you can tell when somebody is praying for the people listening. When we pray, it's direct communication to God and not for anyone else. Um, Luke chapter 18. I'm going to turn there. Luke chapter 18, verses number 10 through 14. If you'd like to turn and cast your eyes on that, this is a good passage of Scripture. Luke chapter 18. They're all good passages of Scripture. Luke chapter 18, verse number 10. Give you a second to get there. Christ gives us a parable here. Luke chapter 18, verse number 10. Two men went up into the temple to pray. The one was a Pharisee and the other was a publican. The Pharisee stood and he prayed thus with himself, God, I thank thee that I am not as the other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. So this Pharisee is praying and in his prayer, you can tell he's obviously not praying to God because he's calling out people in the crowd. I thank God I'm not like this person, this person, or especially like this dirty, rotten sinner right here, this publican. I fast twice in a week. I give tithes of all that I possess. 
He's just going on and on and on, okay? So we see the Pharisee is praying. He's not praying to the Lord. The Pharisee is praying unto men. He's calling people out in his prayer, and he's saying how great that he is. But then we see the publican, verse number um, 12, or verse number 13. And the publican, a standing afar off, the guy who just got called out in the Pharisee's prayer, he's standing far off. He would not lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven, but he smote his breast saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. The publican had the right view of prayer. He's, he's in the corner. He's not in front of a bunch of people. He's praying to God, and he understands. He, he, he's not even lifting up his eyes to heaven. He's embarrassed of, of his state. He knows he's a sinner. When we talked about um, uh, blessed are the meek, the person that has the right view of himself, absolutely nothing, the poor in spirit, this man has the right view of himself. He doesn't even feel worthy to look up to heaven when he asks God for, for anything. He says, Lord, just be merciful to me, a sinner. That's, that's all that I am, dirty, rotten sinner. He's not calling anybody else out in his prayer. He's not saying how great he is. This man has the right view of prayer, and he's praying directly to God. So we pray, um, not focused on anybody else listening, and we also do not focus on the form of our prayer, or prayer focused on the form. There is no right way to pray. There is no wrong way to pray. Even two weeks ago, I had somebody tell me, oh, I... I, I don't know how to pray. It's, it's just, you know, I don't know the right words to say. And I, any, even if you were to ask me, well, what's the right thing to say when you pray? There is no right and there is no wrong thing to say. When you have a conversation with somebody, unless you're weird, you don't like rehearse the things that you're going to say to somebody. When you have a conversation, you're real, you're true, you're talking to that person. There's no right or wrong thing to say. There's no form or formal way to pray to the Lord. So when we pray, don't focus on the people. Don't focus on the form or the words that you would say when you pray. Now, there is a right way to pray. There is a right way to pray. Back in Matthew chapter 6, we have verse number 6 saying, But thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet, and when thou hast shut thy door, pray to thy Father, which is in secret, and thy Father which seeth in secret, shall reward thee openly. The first thing that I see when we pray is we need to pray without distractions. I uh, did a Sunday school lesson a while back. I think it was before pastor was pastor. So it was probably over a year ago, which is crazy. Um, it talks about the closet. A closet is not necessarily what we think is a closet. You got your shoes and your coats or you got your dress clothes in there and it's got a door. The Lord's not telling you go into that closet, close the door, and kind of like hide and be weird about it. A closet is just a room or a place that is set aside for a specific purpose. So here at the church, pastor has an office. We have a library. We have some different classrooms. According to this word, all of those rooms are a closet. It's a room that's set aside for a specific purpose. In your house, you have bedroom, dining room, living room, basement, knee wall, attic. You've got different closets in your house, okay? Different areas. What the Lord is saying, when you go to pray, enter into a closet, a room that's designated for something specific, not where everybody else is. And pray to your Father, which is in secret. So we pray without distractions. When we pray in a public setting here, we always ask people to bow your heads, close your eyes. Well, why do we bow our heads and close our eyes? When we're praying, we don't want to see, you know, if Brother Drew is, or Pastor is picking his nose or if Brother Josh is, whatever, cutting up, checking the scores on the game. When we pray, we're, we need to be focused on the prayer. So we enter into our closet or a room or somewhere that's set aside specifically for prayer. Next, I see that we pray with confidence. Verse number eight. Be not ye... Um, therefore, like unto them, for your Father knoweth what ye have need of before ye ask of him. Is there anything that's a secret to God? No. Is there anything that God doesn't know? No. When we pray and ask God, Lord, so-and-so is sick. They really need a healing right now, or they really need encouragement. You're not telling the Lord something he doesn't already know. The Lord doesn't say, oh, I had no idea that so-and-so was going through a hard time. I, I 
probably should get on that. No. When we pray, we can pray with confidence because God already knows what's going to happen. God already knows about the situation. Many times in Scripture, it talks about Christ going on our behalf. So even if we don't say the right things, even if we mess up or fumble through a prayer, Christ is the one that hears those prayers and intercedes for us to the Father. Even if we ask for something that is foolish or something that we isn't going to happen, Christ intercedes and says, Lord, this is, this is what this person really needs. And Christ intercedes for us in our prayer. So when we pray, be confident because your Father knoweth what you have need of before you even ask of it. When we pray, pray with confidence. Last portion we see is about fasting. Verse number 16 through verse number 18. Verse number 16 reads, Moreover, when ye fast, be not as the hypocrite of a sad countenance, for they desire, or disfigure, disfigure their faces, that they may appear unto men to fast. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. Verse number 16, it shows us that there is a wrong way to fast. Here it says they disfigure their faces. So they would come into the temple, they would maybe be walking a little, little hungover, maybe with a little bit of a limp, their face all sad. Oh, what's, what's wrong, brother so-and-so? Oh, n nothing, nothing's wrong. I'm just fasting, and I'm just really, really, really hungry. Right now, I, I'm also fasting. I had breakfast at about 7.30 this morning, and I'm, I'm going to be fasting until about noon. But you, you wouldn't know it, I know. But no, they would, they would fast, it, and they would... This, the Lord says that they would disfigure their faces. So you could definitely tell that there was something different because they wanted people to ask them, oh, well, what's wrong, brother so-and-so? Do not fast to earn pity. And then also don't fast out of religious obligations. So we see the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they would fast. I don't know what their main purpose was for fasting, but I would think that they probably were fasting because the scripture said that they needed to fast. So they wanted to, you know, they were all about following the law and following the scripture. So they would fast because, you know, that's what a good Christian does as they fast, right? We know that there are specific purposes for fasting. One area that I can think of more specifically would if we fast to draw closer to the Lord. We see Christ withdrew himself and he fasted in the wilderness for much longer than I would fast for. And he did that so he could be closer to the Father, so that he could spend time with them. That, and we see that that is a specific reason for fasting. I don't know what it would be in your life. Maybe there's an uh, answer to prayer that you're specifically asking the Lord for. Maybe it's for cleansing for yourself. Maybe it's just to get closer to the Lord and you want to show the Lord that you're serious about whatever it is and you decide that you're going to fast. But there's definitely a wrong way to fast. And here um, the Pharisees showed the wrong way. But there is a right way to fast. There's a right way to fast. Act normally. You say, where does it say that in Scripture? Verse number 17. But thou, when thou fastest, anoint thy head. And wash thy face, that thou appear not to men to fast, but unto thy Father which is in secret, and thy Father which is in secret, and seeth in secret, shall reward thee openly. Act normally. That, uh, those words there where it says, uh, anoint thy head and wash thy face, that scripture that we did our Bible drill to, Ruth chapter number 3. And verse number three, Ruth is going to see her man. She's going to go see Boaz and she's going to uh, twinkle dust him, okay? She's going to, so what does is, what is her mother-in-law tell her? She says the same exact thing. Wash thy face, anoint thy head with oil. So basically take a shower so you don't smell homeless and put something on that smells good because you're going to go see your man. You're going to win him over. You're going to present yourself the best that you can. Christ used the same exact words that she used. He said, anoint thy head, wash thy face. When you're fasting, and, and maybe physically you don't feel well because you're hungry, you're trying to get close to the Lord, you're serious. When you're doing that, take a shower. You know, put something decent on. Smell good. So when you come to church, you look normal. 
Don't be like the hypocrites, coming all bent over, starving to death, ashen face. We should um, fast to get closer to the Lord. And we should fast to get closer to the Father. Two things that we should focus on when we are fasting. We are going to move forward. This is kind of going back to prayer. The Lord's Prayer, which is in uh, chapter number 6. Very familiar with it. I was debating whether I should have this at the end or should have this kind of in the middle during prayer. But I wanted to do the three things, the three principles that Christ asked. So this is kind of changing uh, pace just a little bit. We're going to talk about the Lord's Prayer. This is going to go with um, that section we talked about prayer, praying the right way, praying the wrong way. Uh, I'm going to read uh, verse number 7. It says, But when ye pray, use not vain repetitions as the heathens do. The Lord's Prayer is a really probably the most popular passage of scripture. You hear it recited, uh, you know, as one of the prayers, you know, that the Catholics would pray at a funeral or wherever. In tough times, you hear people reciting the Lord's Prayer. So right before the Lord gives this example prayer, what we call the Lord's Prayer, he says, when you pray, don't use vain repetitions. Well, what does everybody do? They say the exact same thing over and over. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. And they literally do exactly the opposite of what Christ says. It says, when thou prays, don't use vain repetitions. So here, this is not the Lord's Prayer that he wants us to pray. This is an example prayer, kind of in the format or in the manner of which we should pray. So we see verse number nine. He gives us, the first area that we should add into our prayers. When we pray, we need to address the Lord directly. This, I don't think, is in your printout, but if you want to write these down, these are really good principles to follow when we pray. Verse number nine. After this manner, therefore, pray ye, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. When you pray, however you prefer to address the Lord, that's between you and him, here, Christ says, our Father. God is Christ's Father here, and that's how he preferred to address the Lord. For you, it, it may be a friend, it may be a comforter, it may be your Father. You, you really see yourself as God's child, and that's how there is no right or wrong way to address the Lord if you're using any of the uh, words associated with the Lord. You can call him Lord, God, Father, whatever you want, but when you pray, Dress, uh, address the Lord directly. Everyone addresses the Lord in a different way, but we need to make sure that we know with whom we are talking. I had to adjust that sentence because it was not grammatically correct. The second thing I see is we need to make sure that we desire to do the Lord's will, even when we're praying. Verse number 10, thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. When we pray, we need to make sure that we're asking for things that would be done inside of God's will. Whether you're buying a car, whether you're buying a house, whether you're making any kind of important decision, whenever you pray, let's say you're praying for a vehicle. Say, Lord, I, I really would like to buy this vehicle. If this is the vehicle that you would have me to get. If it's not the vehicle that you would have me to get, Lord, make it very clear and obvious. Because one thing in my life that I do not want is anything that does not line up with what God wants. It doesn't matter if it's something that I really, really, really want or something that's convenient. Sometimes the Lord doesn't have something convenient for you. Sometimes he has something with a little more work cut out for you. Isn't that right, honey? Sometimes he has something with a lot more work cut out for you, but he makes it obvious that this is, this is what I want you to do. So when we pray, we need to make sure that we are praying in the will of God. Verse number 11 Give, unto, uh, uh, give us this day our daily bread. When we pray, we need to ask for our daily needs. The Lord wants us to ask for things. The Lord tells us, ask and it shall be given. Seek and ye shall find. Knock and the door shall op be opened unto you. He wants us to ask for things. When we ask for daily needs, we show God that we are not reliant on ourselves. I, I never want to ass assume that I'm able to go out and work and provide for my family or to provide for myself. You know, a lot, we live kind of like in an empowerment type society where it's like, if you want it, you go get it. Like, you are a woman, you are strong, you can go do it. Which, 
is a decent mindset to have, but in reality, I can't do it without the Lord's help. Just providing for my basic needs, I can't do it. The Lord here says, give us this day our daily bread. Today, I need you to help me provide today. And then tomorrow when you pray, you say, Lord, I need your help to provide today. Pray for our daily needs. We are fully dependent on God, even for the basics. Verse number 12, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Here, Christ asked that we would confess our sin, that we would make sure that there's nothing between us when we pray. He says, forgive us our debts, so the things that we've done, and then also give us the grace and the mercy to forgive other people as well. But specifically, to um, confess our sin and to forgive us. And then the last thing we see Christ uses as an example it would be verse number 13. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Lead us not into temptation. The, the Lord wants us to ask him for guidance. There's a lot of things that Satan's going to try to bring your way. It's going to be different for each one of us. Whatever it is, you know what it is. You know the things that you struggle with. Every day when we pray, we need to ask the Lord, lead, lead me not into temptation. Or if a temptation comes my way, Lord, Guard my mind, guard my thoughts, guard my heart, guard my mouth so I don't say anything stupid because that happens a lot. Lead, guide my feet in the way that I should go so that I wouldn't stray, that I wouldn't go somewhere I shouldn't go. Whatever it is, Lord, and you know what it is, whatever it is, Lord, just protect me. Keep me from temptation. That's the, that is the model prayer. That is the Lord's prayer. That is not a prayer that we just recite and say meaninglessly or aimlessly. This is an example of how we should pray. These are five things that I think the Lord specifically asks us. When we pray, pray with these things included in them. I think if we do that and we really um, try to include each one of these things in here, I think it will really help us pray more effectively. And I think the Lord would bless and hear your prayers if you were adding these things in here.